What's up FTFers? I'm sitting here with Mike Simmons and we've got a little bit of time before our classes start tomorrow. We're already set up and ready to go and everything. And we were just sitting here by this beautiful lake out here in Alabama, Geneva State Forest. Yep. And the subject came up of what would be the best food sources for people if there was some kind of SHTF scenario or the apocalypse or whatever. And we both agree that it's probably fish that's right. gonna be the best. Right. Yeah, I think, I think the waterways are going to provide you way more of an abundant meat source than the land will. And the thing of it is, it's going to offer it to you in much smaller packages, much more manageable packages, rather than trying, like we were talking about, trying to field dress a deer and now you've got this gut pile and carcasses and stuff. Right, like plus that. now you got to make a tripod, you got to smoke it, plus you got to store it afterwards. It's just such a huge the process. Cal the calories spent uh, trying to process the deer and then to hide the tracks that, that you were there and things like that. I think. Uh, water provides a much more varied meat source and things like that too so so something that I'm I'm trying to do is I'm I'm building a brand new pack I, I'm not gonna really to reveal it just yet or whatever but it's something that I'm working on and being that you're an expert fisherman <laughs> I mean you are way better it's than just, me it's just time and failure that's what that is <laughs> I, I hear you but I figure why shouldn't I just take advantage of this situation right here we've got yeah. nothing else better to do we've already prepped for our classes so I thought I would like to show you my kit what I'm carrying because I I am I would not consider myself an angler okay at all okay I have fishing experience mainly from a survival standpoint Y'all see me fish with my watch. Uh, I've, I've used my canteen as my reel. I've made sticks and reels. You know, like I understand the basics, if you will, but something that's really lacking in my knowledge set is I don't know how to hunt specific fish. I don't even know the different fish that are out there. I mean, I, I literally just throw it out there and I'm just praying I get a bite. Right. And whatever I catch, that's what I'm eating, basically. Well, and you, can, you guys, you know exactly what you're going for. Right, and we can break it down. It's just like being, you know, on, on the plains of the Serengeti in Africa. You have you have your ambush predators, you have your your herd animals, you have your scavengers, the the hyenas and things like that. And so we can break our fish species down by those same categories. And then when you go out and, and you're specifically, you're going to hunt that species. So there's predator fish, there's yep. herd animals, there, fish. There are. Out there. Wow, I learned something today. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, I mean, even in a freshwater context, I mean, obviously, like, we have sharks and we have, you know, those are predatory fish right. that are in the sea. But you're telling me the same, uh, it, it exists here in Fresh Lakes. In, in that, you know, that ecology, that, uh ecology setup right there it's the same there there's a hierarchy um, of, of predator prey and things like that uh, a lot of people cool. a lot of people don't know that uh, catfish are ambush predators a lot okay. of people think they're scavengers and uh, they're, yeah I thought they were really like not. just bottom feeders or right um, but well all fish are opportunistic okay if a meal is available they'll take it but their uh, largemouth bass are ambush predators Things like your your crappie or your herd animals. Is that, that why like y'all use the clappers or the crankbait or whatever yep. on, for bass? That is that is to trigger what we call an aggression strike. And so when when a fish bites, when a fish takes a bait, it's similar to how a, a fish strike. And so we call that a strike. And there's two prime ways that you can initiate a fish to bite to strike, okay. and that's through hunger or through aggression. And the hunger huh. strike, it, basically you're presenting something out there that the fish wants to eat. It's hungry, it needs calories, and so it will it will eat it. But that's not a reliable thing uh, because if the fish has already fed or if the conditions are not right, cold front moves in, they shut down, they get what's called lockjaw. Not really lockjaw, but they, they just shut down. They, they wait for well, the- Well, I mean, I hear, all, I hear fishermen talk about this, like the fish just aren't biting. Right. They, right. I, mean, but I think even, we all know about that. Even in those conditions, if you approach it from trying to agitate the fish hmm. and produce either either an, an aggression strike from he's mad 
or you trigger that predatory instinct to where uh, it's if you run away from an apex predator, he's going to attack you. Even like if it the bear, don't right. run from the bear. Whether he had it in his mind or not, at that point, uh, there's certain things that that trigger that predatory response. Cool. And that is way more reliable to me, and I would rather do that rather than trying to leave the fish in control. I want to be in control of of what happens, or have be able to exert more control, because we're never going to be in complete control. The animals actually run this thing. I see a lot of parallels from hunting to fishing. Absolutely. Uh, hunting the funnel. A funnel? Yes. Uh, whether it be uh, a, a, a creek channel coming in that drops into the main channel, whether you're hunting rock piles, whether there's terrain features underneath that you can't see uh, that create funnels and ambush points and uh, create shelter for them. You know, a lot of people don't know that fish need shelter just like we do. They Like their core areas, like a deer would have. They have to maintain their core temperature just like we do. And they do that by uh, ascending or descending in the water column. Do they take the path of least resistance like a lot of yep. prey animals do as yep. well? Yep. Now, I have seen I have seen largemouth bass hunt like a pack of wolves. Really? Yes, I, and in certain times of the year, when they are in the fall, when they're going through their gorge season, um, and and they herd the bait fish, threadfin shad, gizzard shad, you know, your, your little bait fish and things like that, and the water will boil when the the they'll herd these fish up and the and run through there with their mouth open, and the water will boil with really? fish, and then you can see them spread back out. There'll be four or five big fish that spread back out. And they'll go around and they'll herd those things up. Oh again. my God! I can see this is the kind of thing too you can't learn in a day by any means. No, there's. I started fishing with my grandfather when I was five years old, and we we weren't really hunters. Uh, we fished for food. Yeah, that was your thing back right. then, right? That was it. Was very cheap, inexpensive. Um, it was the lowest way to put lowest cost way to put food on the table. It didn't require a whole lot of tackle. It was very simple. Um, so that was, I've been doing this for. That was your foundation, kind of you know, like me and my grandfather hunting. It was just right. the exact opposite because we weren't anglers back and, then. And so, just like with hunting, you you learn to read the terrain, and you hear you hear anglers talking about reading the water. And part of the reason for that is you want to immediately eliminate unproductive areas. You don't want to spend a lot of time trying to hit the bank everywhere, everywhere, everywhere because. 80% of the fish live in 20% of the water. Oh, wow, yeah, that's very similar to what's out here right. with wildlife. Yes, absolutely. Wow, there's just so many similarities. I can, now you're speaking my language. Yeah. Like I can totally get into this. I just never had anybody to show me any of this stuff, right? You know, my dad or my grandfather didn't show me how to tie a hook on or how right. to, you know, put the worm on or how to fish angles, and how to read the water, none of that stuff, you know? Yeah. I just went out and bought reels and eventually got to the point where when I was teaching survival, I, I got a little bit more serious about it, but I was just using the kit that's in my watch and in my belt. But I want to take that to the next level. So would you take a look at my kit and yeah. then tell me what you think of it? Be glad or to. Or what I'm thinking? Like, yeah. you, you can't laugh at me now. No, I'd be glad to take a look at it and, and see what you've got. Uh, see if there's any way that we can expand the capability of what you got to give you some more options? So I went ahead and took some stuff out of my belt. And so this is the, the base of my, my belt. So I have the, the braided fishing line, mm -hmm. which they've seen me fish with. And then I have the Wazoo toolkit that has split shot in it. And then it has the hooks. And then you were telling me that I could use the brass wire. Right. I have no idea what I'm going to use that for, but we're going to find another use for the brass wire out of my Wazoo kit, One you apparently. might have not thought of before. Okay, I'm, I'm totally into that. Now, this is a brand new stainless steel tin that goes in the backside of my watch. It just slides in underneath here, and it locks in. And I got this from Grimm. So if you want to order one, you can. But what I'm thinking is that I want to be able to fit my entire fishing kit into my watch. Okay. And then, and I know this is going to look funny, 
but when I was at demo days, I found this company called Crystal Creek Gear. And since I'm building a new kit, I have this new grail that has these butterfly handles on it. Mm -hmm. And before in the past, I have fished and used this as my reel Okay. when I sling it out. But now this is gonna interfere with it. And plus, it, to be honest, it's a pain in the butt for me because I have to, I mean, once I pull it out of this tube, I can't stuff it back in the tube. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and I can't leave it on my canteen either. Okay. Right. So then I'm left with, I'm having to put it in my pocket or store it somehow and it just becomes a mess. Right. And it's just a big pain in the butt for me. And then I find that depending on what line I'm using, it might actually retain the memory of how I store it. Yep. And so that is just kind of a pain in the butt for me. And so I saw this thing and if you tell me to throw it in the water, I will. <laughs> <laughs> well, what you got, man? <laughs> right, but it it's, it's a reel and it's part of a kit. They okay. actually sell a full kit. So the reel is part of the kit. You can store the tackle in it, and it has another container that goes around it. And really, it's for families. Like, if you want to just take this little bitty kit with you out to a lake or whatever, you can put a slingshot in there. You can put, the, right. there's a lot of different attachments and implements that go into this thing. But this is the reel right here. And so, what I'm thinking is that I can store the line on the reel because mm -hmm. that thing weighs nothing. Right. Right. Yeah. I it's, mean, it's so light. It, an ounce. And then I wouldn't have to worry about messing up my line. Right. I can store the line. And I, I just think it'll work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do too. Yeah. Um, the only thing I would recommend on this is to try to put a lanyard on it back to your wrist. Uh, it's going to put a lot of stress on your fingers. And, and, it's, and if you have any kind of, you know, joint issues or anything like that, but it's going to give you, you know, your ability to control the line and things. So you think it'll work? And the more full that you wrap this, so if, if you get this full, this is going to be the direction that the line comes off. Right. The closer you get this, if you can get this to within an eighth or three sixteenths of an inch of that lip right there, it will cast so much easier and farther. Well, that's going to be a problem because I only have 40 feet. Well, 40 foot cast is still a long cast. I mean, that's, you know, uh, you're probably on average looking at maybe 15 feet, something like that, as far as how long you can throw, how far you can throw. One of the problems with braided line is it doesn't like to stay on something round. Oh, really? Okay. It wants to stay straight. Now, they've got it, they've got it uh, compressed in here and everything, but all of these fibers each individual fiber is is straight and so they they will bend but they don't want to stay that way okay um and there's there's problems with not holding capability yes yes i struggle with that every time that i there's, i've been tying a, a polymer that's yes that's one yeah. of the only knots that will not slip with braided line Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, I didn't even know that. So, yeah, that's you're already ahead of the game on that one. Um, that's exciting. I know something. One of the another <laughs> one, one thing. Another drawback to using braided line is it doesn't stretch. Okay. Yeah. And there, you really need that. So most of the time, your your fishing pole is going to be the shock absorber. And so if you're fishing with braided line, the the fishing pole will take up some of that and and give you a little bit extra time, but fishing with braided line or, or fluorocarbon, a lot of times- Fluorocarbon? People, yeah, that's a, uh, that's an intermediate but between braided line and monofilament. So those are the three, the three main types of line you're gonna encounter are gonna be some kind of Spectra braid, um, and Spectra I think is a brand name, but some, but some kind of spider wire braided line, something like that. And then you're gonna have a fluorocarbon, which is, um, almost invisible in water. I'm having a thought. I have bank line as well. Okay. Yep. We but can it goes that. in my pocket, like for a trot line or something. Yeah, I would. I would save that. Um, if you're going to set up a trot line or or limb lines, things of that nature, you can break that down into so like three. passive fishing. Yeah, passive fishing. Just waiting for them to come to it. Um, but 
for the most part, for hand line fishing or you, any kind of using it on your bottle, I would recommend trying to go with some monofilament because monofilament stretches and you need that extra time. A lot of people pull the lure away from the fish too soon before they have a chance to get a good hook set because there's no stretch in the line. And so the stretch of the monofilament gives just that extra half a second to allow the hook to penetrate. <laughs> yeah, I, I can under, yeah, I've done this. Yeah, and you snatch it away from them because- I resemble the, this statement. The, the reaction is so quick. You, you, you set the hook and everything and it actually pulls so it this, away from So when it. I'm fishing with this one, that's why that's happening then. I would use that for, if I was fishing for catfish, where I was gonna leave it laying on the bottom, one advantage you're going to have with this is abrasion resistance. This yep. is super good for abrasion resistance. So if you're fishing around a lot of rocks, mussel shells, um, if you're trying to fish around uh, down trees, this is going to have much higher abrasion resistance than either monofilament or, or fluorocarbon. So, so basically the kit doesn't have that much capability at this point. It's an excellent baseline kit. I mean, it, there's there's nothing wrong. Everything here will work. Um, it's just going to require a little bit more finesse on the part of the individual. I don't have that yet. <laughs> <laughs> I do not have the finesse yet. Um, you know, you've got some small hooks in here and sinkers and things like that. I've pretty much been catching brim okay. most of the time, which yep. from what I understand, you can use that as a bait fish. You can, uh, a lot of places, depending on your state and local laws, uh, you can use bluegill. You can use any non-game fish as- Non-game fish? Non-game fish. Wait a minute, so, wait, wait, hold on, you gotta define that, because <laughs> I mean, somebody who's watching, they're probably like me, they might have a little bit of experience, or maybe they have no experience, but understand the value of what you're bringing to the table here. So okay. I don't understand what that means. Okay. So. So your game fish are going to be your crappie, your, your bass, um, your stripers, lake, lake stripers, you know, that, which is a, is a true bass. It's striped bass. Um, what about trout? Pretty much, <clears throat> yeah, trout is a game fish because not only does trout have a, a limitation, it has a season. Oh, okay. So, so just like when you're hunting, right? It's the same kind of thing. It's the it's the same difference. So, you know, the difference between deer hunting or hog hunting or something. Yeah. You know, I mean, there may be no limits and no season on hogs. I got you, right? And so they're not considered a trophy animal or a. a I just get a sportsman's pass. That way, I can hunt right. anything. You know, I just go ahead and pay the extra money. That way, I don't have to worry about it. Well, it looks like you've got. A, a good baseline kit to, to, to <coughs> excuse me, pollen season. Um, looks like you've got a good baseline kit here to start with. Why don't we run to the store and I'll help you pick out a few things that will greatly expand the capability of what you got and kind of yeah, build Yeah, now on. we're talking so we can so, force multiply right. what I've already got. That will allow you to specifically target other species. And I think that's one of the things. Yeah, that, I don't know how to target. That's, that's that's one of the things I think people, there's so many correlations between hunting and fishing. I don't think people realize how closely connected and a lot of the same tactics are employed. But when you decide to harvest a specific species, you are hunting that animal. You're, Am I going to have stalking. to put on my ghillie suit to go fishing? Well, there have been times when I was a boy, we always wore camouflage when we went oh, bank, really? bank fishing. Absolutely. So do they see in the same light spectrum that we do? Because you know, like deer, hogs, like all right. the animals that I hunt see in a different light spectrum and that de determines what I'm gonna wear. No, they, they're, it's a little different, it's very similar, it's a little different, but the thing of it is they do have the, the same predator recognition response. Okay. And so if we walk up on the bank and they see this figure here, even though they might not be able to identify what it is, it's gonna trigger that response and they're gonna, they're gonna back off and, and things like that. Now, they see in different colors because only certain light penetrates water. See, the first color to disappear in the in the color spectrum is red. That's the yeah. first color to, right. to go. And and as you go deeper, uh, that, that happens between six or seven, five to seven feet, something like that, depending on water clarity and things like that. 
But and as you go deeper, more and more colors are eliminated. Okay. And so at that point, what you're working with is lure shape, scent, and uh, presentation. Okay. And we'll talk about presentation a little later. That's one of the key topics I wanted to hit. Okay. Yeah, I'm excited. Like, can we go to the store now? Right on, bro. Like, cause we got a little bit of time. The fish are waiting. Do you think we could actually maybe catch something <laughs> and eat today? It's possible. It's possible. It's always possible, right? right? <laughs> yeah, let's go to the store. Right on, brother. Let's roll out. And here we go. Is it me or is this store a lot bigger than the Walmarts? This thing is huge. This is huge. We have to ask for directions to get to the... <laughs> Where is the sporting goods? <laughs> There it is right there. The camping lead the way. The Holy Grail. The awaits. Holy Grail awaits us. Oh, here we oh. go. Here's where Mike is at home. I heard it said one time that anyone that does not know how to catch a fish should not be allowed to dishonor a fish by catching it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm thinking right now is this is a lot like when I go to get tampons for the ladies. <laughs> kind of out of your element. Uh, there's too many choices well that's one of the things is being able to to condense it down into what's productive and what's not and we'll go over that again when we get out there okay. as far as being able to eliminate unproductive things so it's that's kind of a skill so yeah because all i see right now are a bunch of hooks right. but you have something in mind and we definitely have to make sure that everything fits into this tin that's our restrictive container. So yep. as, as long as it fits, it ships. All right, I dig <laughs> it. Let's find some, some hooks then. There's really only two that are in my kit. Um, one is a number six. I don't generally go any smaller than that. Um, and then also a three-aught short shank. So like this would be three-aught. Correct is what you're saying right there, that's three yacht. And that has to do, um, all of the hooks are made from wire and that's that's kind of how they determine the the size of the wire, the strength of it and things like that. Okay, all right, so we're looking for three aught short. So, yes, like this octopus? Correct. Right here? Yep. It's because that's three aught. And part of the reason is the short shank, when you're trying to hook a fish, the longer shank on it, the, the entire shank has to come out of the fish's mouth before it can make that turn. And then also we want the wide gap. Okay. So that we have the maximum opportunity to hook. To, All right. To engage the hook. So. All right, so we so we got the three out, what's next? So then we need just a standard uh, number six bait hook. Number six. And you've got a lot of different, of course, you've got, you know, Aberdeen hooks, which is the bright shinies. Typically we're gonna go with just the standard uh, bronze. Okay. There are applications where you want the shiny, um, but typically we just try. We want to try to conceal the hook. And, so this is a number six, right there. Is that correct? Plain yep. shank. Yep. Plain shank number six. Plain shank number yep. six. Yep. Okay. And you can see the difference. In a number four. Plain shank number six. So what what are you referring to when you say the shank? That's this portion of the hook right Correct. here? Correct. This one is called a bait holder. And if you see on the shank, there are barbs that are on the bank, on the shank. So that's the difference between a ah. smooth shank and a barb shank. Okay. All right, so we've grabbed the hooks that we need. So these are the, the hooks that we're getting today. Now we've got to talk what kind of line well, I typically try to fish with a smaller line, uh, especially if you're gonna be in clear water or, or someplace where there's a lot of heavy fishing pressure. The larger lines that people carry can actually work against you. So I, my standard go-to is, is a six pound low vis green line. Okay, now that's interesting to me because just from a survivalist perspective, I've always gone as heavy as I could go, but what you're telling me is that heavy is not the way to go here. Right. Um, the diameter of the line, it, it affects not only the fall of the bait through the water because you've got all that resistance of the line. It also affects your casting ability because okay. the heavier line, you're trying to pull that heavy line off the reel. So you can actually gain extra distance by going to a smaller diameter line. 
Okay, so let's find the right line then. I'm learning. Let's do this. Um, you've got lots of choices here as well. You've got fluorocarbons. You've got braided lines. Fluorocarbon. Yeah, I have some braided line, which is in my kit already on what I carry, but we don't want to go that. We want to do something else. Right, we're actually looking for stuff that's going to supplement and enhance the capability of the kit that you already carry. Of the kit that I already have. I like it. All right, so, so let's find whichever one. How many pounds were six you saying? Pound, six pound line. That's going to handle most anything up to, you know, your larger catfish. So like that one right there? Right. Um, is there a particular brand that you like? Or? I stick with these two, either Strin or Triline. So Strin or Triline? Yep. And stay away from the clear or the fluorescent blue. The fluorescent blue is okay if you're fishing in low light conditions because you can actually see your line a lot better. But my main concern is concealing the line from the fish. Right. So I'm going to stick with something that is uh, what they call low vis green. Low vis green. Right. Okay. Oh, so that's where the color is, is right there. Right. On it. So and that's what we're getting? Right. And we're going to stick with a monofilament because it has stretch and shock absorption. If we're going to be fishing with a hand line or with a cane pole or something like that, we need that shock absorber uh, resistant. These, the spider wire, braided lines, the fluorocarbon have almost zero stretch. Oh, okay. So just the style of fishing that you know that I'm going to be doing, that's what you're recommending because it will. Right. Okay, I like it. Yeah, let's get that then. Can I, let's see, I need to get this out of the way so I can get it. They've yeah, trapped it. I would pick the one that's. Uh, the one that is the hardest to get yeah. to. Okay. Now, you can also check the dates on these. Um, really? Wow. Used, used to be able to. So down here in the bottom, you want to try to get the freshest line that you can get. This was manufactured, you know, uh, in 23, 10th month of 23. <laughs> the more you know. So, wow. Okay. Right. Now, is there anything else that you would recommend? I mean, like, what about sinkers or uh, what about our, like a bobber, like, the, like we got over here? Do we need any of that kind of stuff? I don't think so. I mean, they're really going to be too big for the kit that we're trying to put together. And then just the extra weight of trying to carry lead sinkers and things like that. Um, it's, it's not as critical. The only time you really have to have sinkers is if you're going to be fishing in a, in a moving current, a stream, a, a river. Current. If you're fishing something like a lake or a pond, having a sinker is not as critical. And so that comes back to bait presentation. Yeah, I'm worried about bait. <laughs> well, the bait, the, the way that you present the bait is more important than the bait that you present. It's all about bait presentation. There you have it. And so if we fish without a weight and we just kind of let that bait fall naturally in a slow presentation, that's how it would be falling if there were no hook and line attached to it. Okay. All right. And so if we throw it out there with a weight on it and it goes to the bottom like that, then that's an indicator the fish is going to be cautious. <laughs> Okay, yeah, it's these little things that really matter. Uh, so, as far as bait goes, though, I mean, is there something that you would recommend to put into that kit that is artificial? I can tell you that. So, my, my preference is always going to be natural, live bait, something right. like that. But if I could only have one color. Only one color. I will show you. It catches fish from Michigan to Alabama and pretty <laughs> okay. much any water conditions, and it's going to be a black and chartreuse. It's black and chartreuse. Yep. Either man, that sounds fancy, man. Either something like a black and chartreuse tube, tube bait, or something with a curl tail. You've got different options as far as the design, the design of the bait. This is a blue, blue, black and chartreuse. But the black and chartreuse, I don't know exactly what color or, or what that represents to them, but I have noticed over my many years that it gets a more aggressive strike. And I think it's an aggression color to them. Okay. And so they hit it much harder than they would a similar bait presented the same way of a different color. We're gonna try to add that into the kit as well with these hooks. Yep. That's what we're gonna go with today. And pl plus we have our line. Yep. So we're gonna add all this stuff in to what I already have. So what are we getting, a three day pass to go fishing? Oh, they need the... Uh, Social security number here. 
So you're ready to take the plunge? D gonna yeah. hook us up yeah. with Mike too. D's man. We're gonna get seven day passes. That's right. We're gonna seven go, day passes. Yep. We're gonna go catch some Alabama bluegill, baby. In in seven days we have to eat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> For this thirty five dollars, <laughs> right? Or this is gonna be a real expensive meal. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah tell us where all the spots are. That's what's up. <laughs> we need to know where they fish me at, D. <laughs> right. Boy, are you legal now too? I'm legal. Baby. Look at that. Yeah. Fly, legal. Fly high and straight. That's right. So now there's a record of it. We ain't going to jail today. <laughs> now, hold on. Where, where are we going now, D? Because you got all the goods. I got to be on camera telling you how it is. <laughs> you, you can't might, tell us on uh, camera? Uh, uh, I might get in a trouble. Oh, man. That's what's up. <laughs> hold on a second. We got some cash. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. What does Benjamin tell yeah. us? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's working. All right. So we got a grand total. No, I don't want to donate anything. I just want to pay. All right, so 1642. 1642 is what we're paying out today. Bam! All right, let's do this. What are we doing, Mike? So the first thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna give you a demo of the knots that I use. You really only need three to, oh. get, to get started. Uh, they're fairly simple. Fishing demo? Not demo? Not demo. Okay, all right, cool, yeah. And so this was the first knot that my grandfather taught me how to tie, it's really simple. Just pass the cordage through, and then you're gonna go make a loop like that, and a loop like that, and then pass, run in down through there. And then it just cinches down. And this would be the hook, eyelet on the hook. Right. And so that's one way to attach to If you're gonna have hook. just the hook. Okay. This knot doesn't allow you to have anything else to add multiple hooks or anything like that. This is just for the hook on the end of the line. Okay. But it's real simple. I mean, it's, and then <clears throat> the second knot, I don't know if you can see it, just try to untie it there. Uh, the second knot is called a polymer knot, and it's one of the very few knots that will not slip if you're going to use braided line. Right. And it retains 90% of the line strength. Um, I can so. totally dig that because of technical rescue. I totally understand that. So, we'll Double this over. That's called, you know, a bite. We're right. Gonna, we're going to create a bite. If, if the line crosses over, it's called a loop. So we're just going to create a bite and push that through the eyelet. Okay. And then we're going to just tie an overhand with that bite. And then around the shank of and the hook. Pass the entire hook through there and then cinch it down. Doesn't like to cinch very well. So we have to dress the Tie, dress, set yeah, it. Yeah, tie, dress, set. Just like you would with a rope. And so. That gives you two lines coming through the hook eyelet. It's a lot stronger. Maximum strength. Yeah. And yeah. Try okay. To, try to dress that up with a paracord. It's a lot easier. Now, when you tie this knot, you really need to wet it down because there's a lot of heat generated when you cinch this down. There's, there's a lot of contact points and everything. So if, if you don't want to weaken your line, you know, oh, so even our fishing line that we got, we need to wet it down right. to do this. To, okay. to tie this knot, just because it creates a lot of heat when you pull it down tight. I got you. Okay. And then... Now we're going to do a third. Yep. Yeah, the, the third knot is a uh, arbor knot. Some people call it a jam knot. It's just real simple. This is what we're going to use to attach our line to the reel. We start out with just an overhand knot on there and then uh, we do that that's ah uh, okay that's the knot. and so when this when this cinches down it'll pull tight because the fishing line is real slippery but when we pull that down that's what we're looking for okay so that's an arbor knot that's an arbor knot yep all right so we got three knots and now we're going to set up our reel right yep. We're gonna we're gonna put some line on this, and then attach the hooks and stuff that we want to use, and then make a lanyard for it. And yep, I think it's important to have a lanyard on it. Okay, all right, let's do that. 
We're going to work out of this six pound line. Okay. Because you've got much heavier lines already included in your kit. Yeah, that is so small. I so wouldn't have done that. I learned something today. We'll save that. And then we're going to put this back in the box. Oh, that. that's smart. <laughs> that's so smart. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. I learned something else. And then if we're going to decide which way we're going to use this. The getting the rotation is important. Now, used to, when I was young, we used to run this through a phone book. You know, because trying to reduce line twist and things like that. But the only the reason we're going to worry about the direction on this is because the direction that you're going to hold it. You're going to be casting like that. Correct. And so you want to be able to stop it with your thumb as it comes off. Right. So I want the line coming off in this direction. So we'll uh, tie us an arbor knot on there. Oh, okay, so you're not going to tie it to the actual shank or the lip right? on there. No, it shouldn't be, uh, there sh shouldn't be any problem with slippage or anything like that. A lot of times, the other thing you can do with this, I usually save it, but this is actually designed to go oh, on, on your reel. on top of it? Right. This is actually designed to go on top of your reel to reduce line slippage. Oh, wow. So I usually save it, but uh, for this one, we'll go ahead and put it on there. We're going to cinch this down. And fresh six-pound line is a lot stronger than what people think it is. But this is a good example. I'm going to show you the, sh the stretch, the shock absorption that I'm talking about. Look at, how much, wow. look at how much that moves. Yeah, do that towards the camera. And you, and you see how much that stretches just in that little bit of line. So if you can imagine that much stretch over 25 feet of line and so that deserves a cheese cracker we're gonna <laughs> now you're just gonna reel out of the box right i'm just gonna sit there and do that we're getting pretty close to where i wanted to be but i think i think we'll try it out like that because it's building up so much back here and everything right so i think I think we'll call that good. And we're just going to go ahead and cinch this down. Yeah, yeah, we'll like just that. Put this on there. Yep, and then that'll, that'll hold keep it. Keep it right there while we while we tie on our tackle. I'm going to wet it down with your mouth. Yep. Saliva is one of the best lubricants for that. And uh, so, is it mucilaginous? Right. It adheres to the cordage. It adheres to it, and it, it's slippery. Well, you want to use the brass wire, or you want to? Yeah, use... I want to do the brass wire thing. I'm I'm kind of okay. interested to see what you come up with for the brass wire. Okay. Like here's my uh, my brass wire. I've already cut the end of it. All right. Now brass is really good because it has a different sound underwater. Really. When you use a lead weight and it's tapping on the rocks and yeah. it's bumping into things, bumping into sticks, it, it doesn't have hardly any sound. And so we're gonna use sound as an attractant and brass um, has a different, has sound, a than different lead. sound than lead. And so if you're in a heavily fished area where the fish are used to hearing lead weights, that's why people- Ah, you know, oh, yes, we have an advantage. You have an advantage because you're making yours stand out. Oh, I like this. Oh, this is going to be so cool. I cannot wait to show the guys at Wazi this. <laughs> this is going to be really cool. All right, so what do we need now? So I'm going to go find something that's got, you know, a small diameter like uh, the... the uh, Broom's Edge or... Broom's Edge. The uh, the hollow core of the broom, Broom's Edge will work pretty good, I think. So let's go get us a piece of that. Okay. Hollow. All right, we'll trim this up. We'll see if we can feed that brass wire through that hole right there. So we'll do that. Let's go try that. So I'm gonna create a little little loop right there. We'll just give it a couple of twists. All right. So we got that. Take our other end. Uh, 
press these through. It may take a little bit. But this this is this wazzy wire is good, man. This is some heavy duty wire. And if there's any of that what they call pith in the middle, then just push that out. All right. So you've got those. And then we want to even out our line, our wire. We'll kind of even that out. Now what this is going to create is a cylindrical weight. And it's going to be less likely to bind up and get, get hung up. Oh, yeah. that's good. Because this is what's going to be dragging on the bottom. So let's take that and start wrapping it. And every time this wire bumps into something, it's going to give off a, a, a sound that they're not necessarily familiar with. And it's also going to have a color that they're not necessarily familiar with. And so that's what you're going to end up with. Wow, yeah, I have never seen that before, ever. And if it feels too light, you can add more wire. If it comes up onto a fork or something, it'll ride right up over it. This is what we call just uh, nose hooking the bait. See how it yeah. just hooks through the nose like that? That'll give it a little bit more action. I'm like so loving that right there. That is so cool. Oh man, this is awesome. <laughs> thanks for thanks for sharing this with me. Can we go fishing now? I hope now? it helps. Let's go try to catch something. Let's go man. catch something. <laughs> you know? hey, oh, that's Blackie. We gotta go. You gotta be kidding me. It's time for instructor introductions. No, no, after. I'm not going, I don't wanna teach. <laughs> you gotta teach, JJ. <laughs> but. I know you wanna fish. Can we fish tonight? Yeah, absolutely. Is that legal? Yeah. yeah completely legal here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah We're can. fishing tonight, then. Night fishing, yeah. <laughs> I am just, so bummed out right now. Hopefully this wind will lay down a little bit. <sighs> Are you serious he did call us? Yeah. Yeah, we gotta go do instructor introductions around the campfire. So. I hate being responsible. <laughs> this was supposed to be a fun... Oh no, this is a J-O-B. Uh. <laughs> Fine, okay, if you enjoyed the video, you wanna see more in the future, if you'd like to see me and Simmons actually go fishing so that we can get proof of concept, then let us know in the comments section. Until then, like, share, subscribe, hit that notification bell, and until next time, fuel the fires.